to the Lord this uh, Wednesday evening. It's just a blessing to be here. Uh, Midweek service. Battle Hymn of the Republic. Hymn 437. 437. <laughs>
if the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is Verse 26 to 21, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent thee, rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. Of course, this, are, this verse 29 is our text verse. For he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. I pray thee before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Let's pray. As I continue this message, the strength of Israel. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we can meet uh, this evening. God, thank you for your goodness and grace, your mercy and truth. Thank you, Lord, for making the opportunity available to us to be in your house. Lord, there are many churches around this world, even in this country, that are closed today. But Lord, I am so thankful that we are open. And God, I am so thankful that there are people in your house that wants to be here, wants to be where you want them to be. And I pray, Lord, as we come, as we're here, I thank you for the good songs we've sang to honor you and lift you up. I thank you for people loving the hymns and valuing it. And uh, it has meant something to them. Thank you for those who've been reading the Bible this week and you have fed them spiritually. My Lord, as we come to the Word of God now, the preaching of your Word, the teaching of your Word, I pray you use it to accomplish your purpose. Bless your Word tonight. Give me wisdom, knowledge, discernment, and understanding as I preach. And Lord, I pray that your Word will be received with humble hearts tonight. And I pray, God, you rebuke Satan and his workers from hindering your work and will. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so so far, we've been talking about the strength of Israel. Is the screen on? We've been talking about the strength of Israel. We said the strength of Israel is referring to God, and it means that he is... Uh, two things I mentioned. There's more to it, of course, but two characters I mentioned. And remember, this is the first one. The strength of Israel means what? He is a God of... He is, a God, he is preeminent. What does that mean? He's outstanding and supreme. Then he's the next name referring to him that means the strength of God, strength of Israel. He's the immutable one. What does that mean? He's not able to change. He's that way always. He's a good God. He's a righteous God. He never makes mistakes. And he's always going to be that way. Then I said number one, it takes the strength of God to understand the will of God. God told Saul and the soldiers to kill everybody in Amalek. Anybody remembers what the word Amalek means? At least the root meaning of the word Amalek. It means what? Part of the word. That produces iniquity. things like iniquities, worries, worries pain, pain, sorrow, things like that. So it's been a part of the work. The Amalekites are not a picture of the carnal nature because Saul is. They're not a picture of the world because the Philistines are. But the Amalekites are the works of the flesh. You're, you're, you're part of a work that is producing sorrow, iniquities, wickedness, troubles. That's why when God says, go to the Amalekites and 
wipe them out, kill them all, God is referring to the Christians also. God is telling us as Christians, we need to wipe out all works of the flesh that produces things of sorrow and wickedness and iniquities and so on. What good will come from the works of the flesh? Amen. None. That's Only right. judgment and more troubles. Amen. But God tells us in that same chapter of Galatians 5, He tells us that we ought to be a part of the work of the Holy Spirit and produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love and joy and long suffering and so on. Then number two, we said, it takes the strength of Israel to be a spiritual Christian. And we talked about um, there that there are some things that are better in life to do. It's not that we're better than anybody else, but there are some things that are better in life to do. Anybody remember one of them? What are some things that is better to do in this life that is better than uh, that what others may do? To lay up treasures in heaven. To lay up treasure, not lay, lay To lay up treasures in heaven <laughs> than on earth here. That's something good. You know, a lot of people don't see it as that way. And some think it's better to lay up treasures on earth. They try to put up their house. Some people have nowhere to walk in the house. They have to walk through the house like a maze. <laughs> Because there's so much things packed up in their house. And uh, of course, um, you know, they have all that. But when they reach to heaven, what will they be able to lay down at the feet of Jesus? What crowns of rewards will they be able to lay down at the feet of Jesus? And what is the next one? Anybody remember this? The next something that we can do that is better than what others may do spiritually. Yes, sir. Okay. God. Yes, to obey God is better than disobey God. We know what God wants us to do, do it. Anybody else? Anybody remember, remember anything else? To love someone is going to hate. Yes, it's better to love than to hate. I said quite a bit of other things. Anybody else remember? That's great. I'm glad you're remembering. Anybody else? Yes? It's better to be in eternity with Jesus than to be alive here on earth. All right, and, and there's a few other things that I said. I said it is better um, to lift up others than to lift up yourself. This is going to help us not to be in strife or in contention with other people when we value the life of other people more than ourselves. Now, I said, number one, it takes the strength of God to understand the will of God. Number two, it takes the strength of Israel to be a spiritual Christian. And now number three. It takes the strength of Israel. To put out. Um, it's supposed to be there. Put out our carnal. Um, put our carnal fire out. Take number three. It takes the strength of Israel. To put our carnal fire out. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Verse 8 and 9 says. And he took Agai. The king of the Amalekites. Alive. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. Remember the story? God tells Saul and the soldiers, kill everybody in Ab uh, uh, Kill all the Amalekites. Look at it. Verse 3. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And what? Spare them, spare them not. But slay both man and woman. Infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. Now don't go and say, God is such a cruel God to tell us to wipe out all these people. Why would God do that? Remember I told you, the Amalekites is a picture of the works of the flesh. We ought to wipe out everything in our lives that is a part of a work that produces troubles and sorrows and iniquities. Yeah. So, but God says, go and wipe them out. But spare nobody. <laughs> and what do we end up finding them do? They go and kill everybody, both man and woman, infant and suckling. But they spared one man, Agag, the king. Now God told Saul to kill both man and woman, infant and suckling. And Saul and his men partially did that. They killed everybody but spared one man, the king of the Amalekites, Agag. Now, what about this man that made them kill children and babies? 
but spirit in it. What was so special about Agar? I mean, why did you do that? Was it that you couldn't kill this man? What is in your heart that you had that you could take a sword and kill a baby? But this man you could not touch. You could not find it in your heart to kill this man. You found it in your heart to kill children. Little boys and little girls. I can imagine these little boys and little girls scared in the corner. And you still took your sword and killed them because God told you to do that. But you couldn't find it in your heart to kill Aga, this wicked man. Later on in this same chapter we find that Samuel said, Aga, you are being a man that has made many women childless. And now your mother is going to be childless because I'm going to kill you. This man is not a good man. I can imagine children. We know they're innocent. They're not, many children are not responsible for their parents' mistakes. But God says our children are responsible because we as parents need to make ourselves uh, sure that we are putting our children in the safe hands with the Lord. So sometimes we are responsible for the judgment of our children as parents. Amen. Because of what we do, what we say, where we go. Amen. So these children's death is not because of these children's sin. These children's death is because of the parents' sin. That's why they were killed. But what was so special about this man? That these children of God could not find it in their heart to kill Aga, but they could find it in their heart to kill children and even little babies that were not sin. The Bible tells us that it was not just Saul that killed the children and the, and, and, and the babies, but the Bible tells us that it was the Generally, it was the entire army of Israel. The name Agag means flame. The name Agag means flame, which, mean, which is a fire. Uh, just as Saul and his soldiers killed everyone but spared Agag, there are many Christians that also uh, partially obey God. It is carnal Christians that partially obey God. They are Christians that remove many evil things out of their lives. But there are some things they keep back that is just like a fire in their lives. They are Christians, when they get saved and they start living for God, they start removing all kinds of evil things in their lives. But then there are some little fires that they keep back in their lives. And these little fires are detrimental to their spiritual life. But they find it in their heart to remove all kinds of other evils in their lives. But in their heart, they, they just can't get rid of this one. And you ask them, why don't you get rid of this one? And sometimes they're puzzled. They don't even know why they're keeping this. They don't even know why they're a part of these sins. They just, they just like it. They just want to be a part of it. But they remove all kinds of other things. The reason... The reason why they keep this cannot be justified. You ask Christians, why do you watch these things? Why do you go to these places? Why don't you come to church? Why don't you go out so They have no proper answer. Their, their excuse cannot be justified. But yet they do it. And the same thing, if you ask Saul, why did you spare this man and kill children? And you ask him, whatever reason he had, it could not have been justified. He had no proper reason. He had no good excuse. He had no divine will of God that told him, spare a guy to kill anybody else. You ask Christians today, why do you keep this little fire in your life? An evil fire now. Not a good fire. The Bible talks about ministers ought to be a flame of fire. God tells us that they are a good spiritual fire. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is like a cloven fire over your head. So there are good fire, but there's also some evil fires that God says ought not to be a part of your life. And if you let these fires, these evil fires, stay in your life, it will consume you. It will destroy your spiritual life. And you see, Saul, this carnal man could not find it in his heart to kill Agag because 
it was a picture of his present state spiritually. Not killing Agag was showing that Saul removed certain evil things in his life, but yet he kept some little evil fires in his life that was going to be detrimental as a spiritual king in his life. And it's the same thing with Christians. We partially obey God. when, As we grow up for God, we remove certain things in our lives, but yet we keep these things. But the reason why we keep them cannot be justified in the will of God. Amen. You, you can't prove that this is a divine will of God. Uh, you cannot prove that this is what God wants you to do. It's just a carnal nature in you to keep that evil flame in your life. Um, this fire is a wrong fire that if allowed in your life will devour your spiritual walk with God. Just as I asked the question, why did the people spare Agag but kill everyone else? And we were puzzled by that and we had no reason that can be justified. We are puzzled also as why do many Christians remove some evils in their lives but yet keep some. What about this flame of evil that is so important to keep? Why, why is it so important that this little flame of fire that is so wrong? You remove all kinds of other things in your life, but you keep these or this one. What is so important about this one that you have to keep? The Bible talks about some evil fires that if allowed to stay in our lives will consume you. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27, 29 <coughs> tells us the first one. Proverbs 6, 29, 27, 29 tells us that adultery is an evil fire that will destroy your body. Can a man, look at it, verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not burn, not be burned? Look at verse 29. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Now, look this way, please. Notice, God calls this woman in these two verses the neighbor's wife. Why? Because any woman besides your wife that you have lustful thoughts of or a physical relationship is called adultery. That goes for single men and it goes for married men. If you have lustful thoughts or sadly to say a physical adulterous affair with a woman that is not your wife, it's called your neighbor's wife. She doesn't belong to you. Your wife belongs to you. Bible says the two shall become one. She is now yours. He is now yours. So if you are having lustful thoughts in your heart about another woman or another man or, or you having a physical relationship with somebody um, that is not your spouse, Bible calls that adultery. Yeah. The Bible calls this adultery an evil fire. The Bible says, can a man take this fire and put it to his bosom and he not be burned? Can a man walk on hot coals with his feet and it not be born? It's a rhetorical question, isn't it? It means yes. If you take fire and put it by your clothes, you are going to get burned. Yes, if you walk on hot clothes uh, with your bare feet, you are going to get burned. You said, preacher, I know some people who walk on hot clothes with their feet <laughs> and they did not get burned. That is a very few people that might be able to do so. But generally, everybody, you walk, you go ahead. Let me put some hot coals on this floor here right now and tell you to walk on it and see if your feet do not get burned. It is true. And God says adultery, lusting in your mind about somebody else that is not your wife, having a physical relationship with somebody else that is not your spouse. I, I don't want to say just wife, but your spouse. Because both men and women are, can, can be guilty of this. It's an evil fire. Here, why would Christian, why would a Christian give up other evils and would not even care to be a part of some evil things in life, but they make time to lust? You would find these Christians, these Christians will not take time to drink a beer because they've done with that, they've given up that. 
They would not take, they would not even dare say, give me a cigarette and smoke it. You see, they gave up so many rules in their lives. But they make time to think lustful thoughts about somebody else that does not belong to them. They make time, uh, some sadly, I hope nobody here, make time to even go and commit a physical relationship with somebody that is not their spouse. They will not dare do certain evil things, but they make time to do some evil, some other evil things in their lives. And God calls these, these this, this first one here, adultery. It's like a fire that if consumed and laid upon yourself, will burn you. Uh, the Bible says it will burn your clothes in shame and it will burn your feet from sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at the next one. Here's another evil fire found in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 18. It says, As a madman who casts a fire brands, arrows, and death, so is, a, so is the man that deceived his neighbor and said, I'm not I in sport. The scripture says here that one who lies is like a madman casting firebrands, arrows, and death. Yeah, this is a man, a man who lies to somebody, not just your neighbor who lives next to you, but anybody that you come across as your neighbor. The Bible says a man who lies to his neighbor is like a madman. And this madman is out to hurt this other person with firebrands, with arrows, and with death. Why? What good can come from lying to someone? Why would a Christian give up cussing? They wouldn't cuss, but they'll make time to lie. True. You see, why, would, why did Saul and his army kill everybody else but spare their God? And why are Christians getting rid of all kinds of evil things in their lives, but keeping some little evils that are like a fire in their lives that will consume them spiritually. Look at verse 20 and 21. Proverbs 26 again. Verse 20 and 21 says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife sees it. As coals are to burn in coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. God says here that the one who makes mischief and strife with his lips is like fuel to fire. But if the Christian removed this fuel, there would be no fire of strife. There would be no tail bearing. The word tail bearing means to uh, use your tongue to gossip or lie or speak words that causes trouble, causes mischief. You know if you said this about this person, it's going to cause trouble. What you're about to say is not good. You're a tail bearer. You're, you, you have a story that you're bearing about all over the place from your tree of life. God says, if, uh, if you remove these fuels from this fire, there'll be no strife. There'll be no tail bearer. There'll be no contention or quarrels. What contention means? To, uh, to quarrel, to row, to argue. Bible says, you remove these little fires, there will be no fuel to feed the strife. There will be no fuel to feed the gossiping. There will be no fuel to feed the contention in your life. Hear me? Why, would, why should Christians keep these fires? What is so important about talking evil about somebody? You ask Christians that they will do it and you question them. Why would you do something like that? And they're puzzled. Because the truth is what you're doing cannot be justified. Yeah. You ask Saul, why did you keep Agag? Why did you kill these children and spare Agag? And his excuse cannot be justified in the will of God. <clears throat> you ask Christian, why, why, they, um, why, they, why, why were you quarreling? Why were you rowing? Because he did this. But what does the Bible say? Now you, can, you can justify why you're quarreling. Because of what somebody else may do. But what does the Bible say about you? That if somebody does something to you, should you do quarrel? Should you, should you row? Should you argue with them? Just because they did something like that? Scripturally, biblically, divinely? See, some of the things we do cannot be just fight, yet we find ourselves doing it. 
Yet we find ourselves keeping this fire, but there are some other things we wouldn't do. Why should these evil fires burn and other evil fires be quenched? Again, the Bible tells us about another evil found in James chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasted great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among uh, among our members that it defiled the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Here again, listen please. I'm almost done. The Bible says the tongue can be used for both good and evil. But sadly, it can be used to do more harm upon others than good. Amen. The tongue can spread great fires of boasting. And the tongue is so small in your body. You have, your hand is much longer than your tongue. And, uh, but yet, the tongue is so small. And it can boast so much. It can make a story in your life so extravagant, so amazing. The tongue can build yourself up pridefully. The evil fires of this small tongue can consume the entire body of the Lord. The Bible says this tongue is just a small member in the, oh, with, with all the members of the body, but yet this little tongue can destroy your entire body. Here's a little fire. You know, we won't let your hands touch certain evil things. We won't let our feet carry us to a certain evil place. But yet we spare that tongue sometimes, don't we? Oh, you would dare find us in a rum shop. Please not me. I was buying some fish and chips, uh, probably last year there, I made it over there, I think, by there. But I was buying some fish and chips. And I asked them, do you have any drinks? And they said, no, there's a shop right there. I said, that's a rum shop. And I'm not going in there to buy no drink. And you know, we wouldn't dare set our feet in a bar, but sometimes we spare our tongue to say evil things to people. We won't find our hands picking up a beer, at least not me, or a pack of cigarette. Why sometimes we spare that tongue to lie and speak mischievous words, and sometimes use it to cause strife or quarrels contentions and so on, disagreements. Yeah. See, we, we question so why did he spare again? But we do the same thing. We spare so much evil yeah. in our lives. Yeah. We're no different. Yes, sir. Um, why would Christians give up drinking? Even immodest clothes. You, you'll find Christians dressing so decently and modestly, and praise God if you do. But yet they'll spare that tongue to uh, destroy their spiritual life. If you would say, um, is it because they were dressing ungodly that caused them to shift away? It wasn't. If you would say it was alcohol that caused them to backslide, it wasn't. Oh, but that tongue, they spared that tongue many times. And that little tongue destroyed their spiritual life. Let me show you the last thing I'm done. First Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2 tells us about another evil fire. It says, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in a lot of times, some, thank God the word says some, eh? Some shall depart from the faith. Not everybody. I'm so thankful for that. Amen. Giving heed to seducing spirits. Notice that's a common S. That's a lot of evil spirits around us. Trying to pull us away from the Lord. And doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now look this way, please. This evil fire... Is the Christian not able to see and feel convicted that their disobedience to the word of God is wrong and that they need to repent of it? This conscience, this evil fire that is found here in 1 Timothy is a conscience seared with a hot iron. It's like a hot iron trying to iron a hands and it, it burns the material where the fire is gone. Now the, the, the cloth is now shining. Because all the furry part of it is gone. It's seared. And God says sometimes our conscience becomes like that. It gets 
burn, it gets seared with a hot iron. And God says, in a sad situation, when a Christian can come to the house of God or hear the word of God somewhere else, or read the Bible and, be, and, and, and know what the Bible says about something in their lives that is not right. And their conscience don't bother them. And what they're doing is wrong. And that they should repent of that. They leave with no repentance. They leave like if the wrong I'm doing, so what? It doesn't bother me. But you ask them, you ask them this question, why don't you repent? Why don't you come to God? Why don't you give up that sin? Don't you know what the Bible says? And their excuses cannot be justified in the will of God. They were just, they're just allowing these things to stay dormant, stay, sorry, not dormant, but stay in their lives to burn and to consume their spiritual lives. They come to the house of God and will hear God's word and they will be made aware that they are not obeying in some area, but they're still not bothered by it. They will not feel the conviction to obey and will leave God's house with their conscience getting worse, even worse. They come to the house of God. God's word is clear. It is direct and I hope it is. I hope the word of God, even though it's a deeper study, is still made simple and available to everybody. Yeah. But I, you know, the word of God is so clear. They know what wrong they're doing in their life. And they will walk over the church not bothered that the wrong that they're doing is wrong. And your conscience gets even worse. Eventually, it will be seared with a hot iron where it will not bother you at all about the wrong that you're doing. It's true. It's a sad situation when a Christian is like that. Why would Christians feel it is wrong to drink a beer, but it's not wrong to be in God's house? You know, there's some people not coming to church, but they wouldn't dare drink a beer. They wouldn't dare pick up a beer. But it doesn't bother them that it's wrong to be in the house of God. That it's wrong not to be in the house of God. It, it doesn't bother them at all. It doesn't bring no conviction. You go and invite them to church and say, you know, why don't you come? And it brings no conviction upon them that they should be in the house of God. And this is a place, thank the Lord, that people are constantly, constantly behind other people that are falling away. Somebody's always calling somebody. Somebody's always visiting somebody. And I thank the Lord for that. See, if you backslide, your conscience has to be really bad. That you know people are constantly asking why you're not in the house of God. And it doesn't bother you that you know where you need to be and you're not there. Um, why would Christians feel it is wrong to hurt someone physically but see nothing wrong with people going to hell spiritually? You know, I don't believe there's a Christian here that will pick up a wood and hit anybody or use their fist to hit anybody. I don't believe there's a Christian here that would, would want to hurt anybody or even kill anybody. I don't believe there's a Christian in here. But why, why don't we see it as wrong to see lost people going to hell? How can you stand up and see somebody pass you and not give them a gospel track. How can you go to work and sit on a bus and still not give them a gospel track? You wouldn't dare slap them. You wouldn't dare hurt them physically. But you see nothing wrong with them going to hell. Something's wrong here. And you ask them why? why? Why would you allow this? And they have no reasons to justify their acts. You won't hurt them physically, but why would you spare them in this area? You would sit in a car, and you know somebody is in that car with you that is not safe. And you say, preacher, how would you know if they're safe or not? Why did you ask them? Why don't you make a conversation with them and say, uh, do you go to church anywhere and bring up a certain topic to find out if they're saved or not? 
But how can you sit in a car with somebody that is not saved? You won't, you won't dare say certain evil things to that person. But you would see nothing wrong with them going to hell. My wife and I was talking yesterday about, you know, there was a time where you could see genuine revival of people coming to church and getting saved and surrendering to the Lord. Amen. You could hardly see any of that today. Amen. And we were talking how about that crusade where the Danets got right with the Lord. And through that same crusade, somebody in a car gave, was it Shania? Shania? Shanella. A, a flyer. Remember that young lady? And she saw that flyer, saw the tent, and came to the crusade and brought her or uh, 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 the living relationship that she was in. And she came to come to the church. Boy, I, I thank God for that, that somebody in that car saw that it was a need to give her a flyer. Amen. She's, she's passed away now. But thank God she's in heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. That little girl that died in that, fire, uh, that accident is in heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Because somebody, they, that person in that car would dare not hurt them physically. But they dare not let her walk out that car without something to invite her to Christ. Thank God for that. Why would they feel it is wrong not to be thankful to someone for their kindness, but they feel no conviction about their lack of praise and thankfulness to God? You know, somebody does something kind to you, you'll feel bad not saying thank you to them. But look how much things God do good for us. Amen. Amen. And we barely can give a little praise to God. Amen. And God constantly, numerously, Blesses us as much as the sand is oh, upon yeah, the sea. Yeah, Sometimes our lips are so silent That's to right. the praise and thankfulness to God. You see, we're no different from Saul. We, we, we remove certain evils from our lives, but we keep some. And those same little fires that you keep, it might seem like a little fire, but the Bible says those little members are able to consume your entire spiritual life. This disobedience was one of the reasons he was, Saul was condemned to die. And why would Christians remove themselves from many evils but keep some evil flames in their lives? These little flames, if not removed through the strength of Israel, will consume your spiritual life. Please, let's all stand, please. Our Father God, we thank you that we can meet in the house of God tonight. What a blessing it is to be here. And I pray, Lord, you bless the invitation. As your word have gone out, I do pray that it would have been received with humble hearts. <coughs> and I pray, Lord, that good decisions will be made unto you tonight. In Jesus' name. Folks, right where you are, just for a moment, I'll, I will be silent just for a moment. And I will give you an opportunity to pray about what the Lord spoke to your heart about tonight. Go ahead. <clears throat> Our Father, what a blessing it is to be here tonight. Oh, what a blessing it is to have the freedom to serve you in your house. We're so thankful. Even our neighboring countries don't have that privilege. But I thank you, we do. And I pray, Lord, as your people have made the effort, some it is being made available, some have to work, some have to do other um, uh, things in their lives, and they cannot be here because of the change of time. But Lord, I thank you that we are here and the decisions that have been made. Bless now as we go, that your word will not fall to the ground, but it will be received and will grow spiritually in our lives. I pray for a revival. I pray, God, for repentance if that needs be. And I pray for safety as we go out, protection and watch over us and guide us. God, do fill us with the Holy Spirit. 
and use us. In Jesus' name, <coughs> amen.